Toby and Hannah wanted to practice the question, how does Harper Lee present innocence in To Kill a Mockingbird? Now, this is a fairly complex topic, and to be honest, it's unlikely to come up. Most people, most candidates, when they think of the word innocence, will most likely think of innocence as not guilty. And so they'd end up writing an essay about injustice um, and guilt and so on. What um, Hannah and Toby actually meant was innocence as in the state of childish innocence. Innocence as being uncorrupted by a wider society. Innocence as juxtaposed with experience. This, however, is a very useful topic and it links to a range of other important areas, so I'll be considering it. So, first of all, um, as you can see, innocence contrasts to experience. That's a phrase which would be very useful for you to use um, in literature, for example, uh, William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience explore this uh, contrast. Scout journeys from innocence to experience, ostensibly so, throughout To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a Bildungsroman. So in your introduction, you would most likely define this topic um, and you would of course make that link to the novel's literary context, the genre of a Bildungsroman. However, there is a key debate here, and this is really a star 8, 9 uh, material. To what extent is Scout innocent at the start of the novel? To what extent does she demonstrate a real state of innocence as we would understand it? There are a range of possible answers to this. Whoops. At the start of the novel, um, in one sense, um, Harper Lee does emphasise Scout's childishness in a way that would suggest, yes, she is an innocent character. So details in the narrative voice that emphasise this childishness um, include, for example, um, her reaction to the snow, she says, the world's ending. There's a distinctly childish narrative voice throughout the opening chapters. Consider, for example, the description of Miss Caroline. She, quote, looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. There are other examples of childish imagery throughout the, the opening few chapters. However, although Scout's youth is emphasised at the start, this isn't necessarily innocent per se, it's more like ignorance. A point to illustrate this, um, Scout and Jem's awareness, or lack of awareness, sorry, of the failures of society. Um, so, for example, uh, Toby uh, pointed out, um, she mentions the, quote, nigger snowman, and she doesn't mean that um, in a racist way. Um, so she's not aware of society's failings. She, um, she just uses this term fairly innocently. And in fact, as, um, as Hannah pointed out, um, there's a potential double meaning of the nigger snowman. It's symbolic um, for everyone being the same underneath. Um, but moving on, though, there's a more convincing argument that no, Scout isn't really in a state of innocence because she has already been corrupted by the wider society. This is where the context points really come in. Even if, Scout, even if Scout isn't totally aware, she is still already expressing prejudice. She has still absorbed what society has told her. So the context point that we link to here is clearly the Jim Crow era Deep South. 
she has grown up in this time of segregation. Remember the words of Alice Lee. You knew black people, but you didn't know them socially. They were, quote, a servant class. Scout is accepting this status quo that referred to blacks, that saw blacks, as somehow inferior beings. The two examples of this, we should know these by now. First one is um, when when they hear a gunshot, Atticus says, um, sorry, Jem says, uh, Mr. Radley uh, shot at a Negro in his yard, quote, oh, did he hit him? Remember that the very casual way in which um, Scout says this implies that such a thing is an everyday occurrence not worthy of further comment. Similarly, when the children are talking about hot steams, these are sort of ghosts, ghost-like beings, they are dismissed as, quote, nigger talk. And that phrase itself, nigger talk, implies that black people are just more likely to believe in these absurd superstitions. They are less rational, and so on. Another way that um, Scout has absorbed um, prejudice um, is class or family prejudice. Here is where you can get some good argument in. The Boo Radley game, many would say that um, it's just an innocent, childish pastime. However, think about where they get all this information about Boo Radley from. Think about where they get this image of him as a, quote, malevolent phantom and so on. It comes from the prejudice of society. It comes from gossip. It comes from rumours. Remember, Harpley is quite specific. Um, a quote that's repeated in this initial description of Buradi is, people said, people said. The context point, of course, is how in the Deep South, um, Southern pride and a yearning for the past aristocratic way of life before the Civil War resulted in an intolerance of outsiders. So even the Boo Ready game, which many would interpret as an innocent childish game, can be seen as stemming from social prejudice which Scout has absorbed. And the context, yes, small town prejudice, as, um, as I remarked. Okay, there's also um, examples of class prejudice and so on. For example, um, the attitudes towards the Cunninghams and the Yules. He's one of the Yules, miss. He's a Cunningham, miss. Okay, so once again, even though Scout does not mean this in a consciously prejudiced way, she has still absorbed um, this, this culture of prejudice in the small town of Maycomb. Moving on a little. Ah, oh, yes. Dill. What does Dill do? Well, one of the things that Dill does in the novel is he represents innocence. He is the only character, perhaps, who is truly innocent. Contextually, he comes from the more tolerant North, states which um, did not... Um, practice segregation to such a degree and were seen as more liberal. Uh, the prime example of this is how Dill, remember, he weeps in, during the trial, he bursts into tears, whereas Scout and Jem, they don't see what's wrong. So this is when uh, Mr. Gilmer is cross-examining or interrogating Tom Robinson. He uses the term boy a lot, and as we know, boy is um, something that you do not say to, um, you, you, you would not address a young black man as boy in the United States because it's got quite heavily racist undertones. Um, it um, harkens back to slave and master relations in the, um, in the slavery era. So Mr. Gilmer um, talks to Tom in this very belittling way um, and it's what makes Dill cry. Dill uh, remarks that it's, quote, hateful. Um, Red Scout and Jem 
Um, they just think Mr. Gilmer's doing his job. They just don't realise what, how unpleasant and racist he is being. Dill, in his innocence, is the only one who, who sees this. And one of the final things that Dill says in the novel is that in the future he wants to be a clown, but a different kind of clown. He is just going to stand there and laugh at people. Now, ironically, this is wisdom. Dill is the one who actually sees society and prejudice and all the bad things for how absurd they truly are. Yet we associate innocence with childishness, with unknowing. How ironic then that the most innocent character is the one who sometimes demonstrates the greatest wisdom. Let's return then to how Scouts and Jem's attitudes change because of their formative experiences, the ways in which Scouts grows from innocence to experience. Remember that key transition, innocence to experience. So as we know, and we're looking back to the themes of prejudice and the themes of tolerance here, um, Scout's attitude changes throughout the novel after some of the key um, educational experiences uh, that she has. So for this we would consider things such as the Mrs. Dubose chapter. Remember the lesson that um, Scout and Jem learn after this. Um, Courage is not just a man with a gun in his hand. Um, Hannah, Toby and I also talked about how um, this refers back to the Mad Dog chapter. Atticus is, is, if you like, undoing any false lessons they might have learned from the Mad Dog chapter. Remember that in this chapter, although they learn that, um, that Atticus is courageous after all, that um, he is an admirable figure, and um, that this is the case even though they wouldn't have thought it to look at him at first, Remember, he demonstrates his skill by firing a gun. So Atticus, Atticus it's like he's sensed that the children have learned something about him. But he doesn't want them, as he says, to think that courage is just a man with a gun in his hand. Remember, technically, all he's demonstrated is that he's able to conform to the typical um, stereotype of the um, southern gentleman, able to fire a gun and save his family. Okay, you couldn't really get more patriarchal than that. Um, so Atticus sets up the Mrs. Dubose lesson. Remember, even if they hadn't uh, trashed her garden, he was going to send them there anyway. He sets up this lesson in order to teach them um, that courage is not just a man with a gun in his hand, as he says. We know, of course, that um, the trial is an enormous um, is an enormous lesson for Scout, um, a very formative experience. You could talk a lot about the events in the trial and how these change her. But, um, of course, how is her growing tolerance demonstrated uh, consistently throughout the novel? Well, it's in her attitude to Boo Radley. Remember the model introduction that we did for an essay, for any essay, on Boo Radley. Boo Radley is not just a character, he's a symbol. Scout's attitude to Boo Radley changes just as her attitude towards prejudice in wider society changes. As she learns more about the nature of prejudice, she begins to apply it to her own life and her views on Boo Radley change. For example, after various key events, the children, not just Scout, 
empathise with him. They realise maybe he doesn't come out because he doesn't want to come out. Maybe he doesn't come out because he's got nowhere else to go. And at the end of the novel, remember, it's all summed up when Scout rather wonderfully sees the, the events of the entire book from Boo's perspective, literally so, as she is standing on his porch. So remember that wonderful flashback towards the very end of the book. And this climaxes in the phrase, Boo's children, which really demonstrates how she is able to see what he means to her and what they have meant to him. Contextually, well, perhaps this links to Harper Lee's optimism for the future. Remember, Mockingbird is set in the 1930s. Scout and Jem grow up into tolerant characters who are aware of prejudice and um, who have the capacity uh, to recognise it and to challenge it. Remember, of course, um, Scout is able to recognise Miss Gates' hypocrisy uh, in school. Remember when she is um, getting red in the face about um, the persecution of Jews in um, Nazi Germany, um, but has been seen to exhibit racist attitudes of her own, saying that black people were getting above themselves and it's about time someone took them down a peg or two. So... Scout's growing tolerance links to Harper Lee's optimism for the future because Mockingbird, of course, was written in the 1950s, the height of the civil rights movement, with cases such as Brown versus the Board of Education um, in the Supreme Court that challenged uh, segregation and civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. So, with a few digressions, with rather a lot of digressions, we have considered how To Kill a Mockingbird goes from innocence to experience, mostly innocence. Um, so hopefully this will be of some help. <laughs>